still it's yeah, it's a it's a, a nuisance, but still yeah, it hasn't stopped me from doing doing anything. But a little bit extra sleep, so yeah. But I think it's all going around for for many, including uh, Deb. Does Debbie? Is it kind of the cold symptoms? Yeah, it's, it's like, uh, yeah, cold, uh, yeah. I'm not getting sick now, too. So. Yeah, yeah. So just yeah. Uh, and my wife was sick for. Yes, she got it two weeks before me, and then she was over it, and then I, but I think she gave it to me, and then I gave it back to her, and <laughs> so it just uh, ne never ending. So we'll start praying the prayer of confessional illumination. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that you uh, love us. We thank you that you are, your presence is with us, your presence is powerful. We th also thank you for your word. But we know uh, we need to have clean hearts, cleansed hearts, purified hearts. Uh, when we're in your presence, thank you that you've sent a Savior, Jesus Christ, into the world, the Lamb of God, to die on the cross for our sins. But we know we need to confess our sins, so now in the quietness of our hearts, we confess our sins before you. Father, we thank you that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pray that you will illumine our cleansed hearts this morning with your word and help us to apply your word to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we are nearing the end of Paul's life. This is his final letter as we've been sharing. And so now we're in chapter 4. Of four in Second Timothy, but of course, when he wrote it, there was no such thing as chapters, so we can call this the last sections. So, if, you, if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word from Second Timothy four, verses one to five. Second Timothy four, one to five. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for its power. We pray this morning that we'll be able to learn from your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And so remember, this is written from prison in Rome. So Paul has the death sentence, and he knows he's going to be dying. So these are important words. He's, he's giving exhortation instructions to, uh, to the young pastor Timothy. And so it's very significant. You know, when, when, when we're near the end, uh, we only talk about things that are important. And so this is clearly important. Uh, and he is, as we saw last time I was here, Paul highlighted Scripture. So that was 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, review, correction, and training righteousness. So now he's going to talk about what that means uh, practically, which is basically to preach the Word. And, um, and he also talks about uh, the, the danger of being uh, just listening to preachers that, are, that make you feel good. And we call that the prosperity gospel. And so we'll talk a little about that. Uh, but as we look at uh, verse 1 of chapter 4, uh, it's a charge. So charge is a very serious um, instruction. And a charge means, means uh, this is a very, very important and charge is in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. So this is, this is ultimately who he's answering to, not Paul, but to God and, and to Jesus. And, um, and the ultimate goal is based on uh, this idea of judgment. Um, and that God is the judge. And it was interesting, when I was at the mosque at the end of Ramadan, what the imam asked me, he said, is, do Christians believe in the day of judgment? Isn't that amazing? He asked me that. And so, because 
Uh, Muslims typically believe that in the days of judgment also, but if your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then you go to paradise. But I, I, to answer that question, I said, Christians believe that Jesus paid the price for our sins. So he, because of his sacrifice, as the perfect sacrifice, all humans who believe in him will be judged righteous by God and go to heaven. So that's a big difference, that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. And so that is, that's the gospel. And so it was amazing to be able to explain that in the mosque in response to a question. But it's all, that's about the day of judgment. So that's what Paul is saying here. Uh, God, they, uh, God and Jesus judge the living and the dead. And by his appearing in his kingdom, then he says, uh, we need to preach the word. So, so this is the, 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 the charge, really. It's, it's vitally important uh, for Timothy uh, to preach the word. And so this charge in verse 2 is spelled out by, by uh, action words, uh, preach the word, uh, be ready <coughs> in season and out of season. So first of all, this idea of preaching, and it's a big question, what's the difference between teaching God's word and preaching God's word? And so that, that's very, very, like I, I teach math, but and some of my students would say, I preach math, because right, I'm so passionate about it. So it comes down uh, uh, to what you're, what you're teaching about. And um, there's a deep theological meaning. So the, when I was in seminary, I took a class called homiletics. Have you heard that word before? Homiletics. And so that comes from the, the word homily. So if you go to a Catholic church and there's a priest, the priest as part of the Catholic service, gives a homily. So a homily is basically a short sermon. And so, uh, and, and, uh, whereas a sermon is typically at least uh, 30 minutes, sometimes longer, uh, a homily is sometimes just 10 or 15 minutes. So sometimes, some churches after, uh, the Protestant churches after communion, they'll say this is, a, this is a homily. And so, but the idea is homiletics is the art of preparing sermons. So we say humble. So I learned how to prepare a sermon and, and what uh, anybody who's taken homiletics, the, the class in seminary, uh, is pretty scary. You know, so I was I was pretty young and I hadn't I hadn't preached very much before. And the uh, most who take homiletics, they learn the, the number one rule or guideline is for eight this is what is taught, which is not very realistic, for every minute of preaching it takes 30 minutes to prepare. Isn't that interesting? So if you have a 30 minute sermon, how many hours is that? Yeah. 15 hours to prepare. Did I do the math right? 30, 30 minutes per, uh, per minute of preaching. And some say an hour. So 30 hours, so, but typically, and this is the challenge at a, at a large church, uh, usually there's the senior pastor, that's their main role, is to preach. And so they have, they have time to do that. But a smaller church, there are many, many different roles for a pastor. And so, and so that's, that's the challenge. Um, and so, um, so by studying homiletic, oh, and then I also had to be videotaped um, uh, preaching. And then the class would analyze everything. But, but homiletics, you learn about hand gestures, you learn about pacing, you learn about how to prepare the sermon. Yeah, so for instance, so I learned um, to prepare a sermon, it's not just a, uh, even if it is a lot of time, it's not just sitting down and, 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 and writing it out. It's very different. It's, it's basically reading the text. I read the text early in the week, and then I pray, I ask God what what are the most important elements of that? Because God's word is so unique and living and active uh, and powerful. And so throughout the whole week, that's what I'm thinking about and praying about. And God kind of downloads illustrations and ideas. And then uh, and they, they jot down notes. I also check um, uh, some, uh, near the end of the process, I check uh, like a study guide kind of, so I can make sure I don't miss anything. And so others have analyzed as well. So it's a, it's a, it's a big process. It's not just like a, a, a job. You say, okay, three hours to prepare my sermon. And so that, that's the responsibility. Um, and so 
Um, and it's also something that improves with, with practice. So the more I preach, the more I, I get uh, confident in being a messenger of God's Word. And so that's this idea of, of, uh, of homiletics. Um, and, um, and it's interesting, it's not just uh, this idea of homiletics is, can be helpful even for someone who's not a pastor. So typically, um, churches often have elders, certain churches, and elders often are preachers as well. So uh, there's, a, there's a, a church called Grace Community Church with John MacArthur. Have you heard of him? So he's 84 years old. He's still preaching very powerfully. But the model of that church and many others that follow that that model is that he's not the only one that preaches. There are elders who are not ordained pastors, but they are gifted and commissioned uh, as preachers. And so they, they also preach. And so there's a big advantage actually having, uh, having elders also preach, not just the pastor, because the idea is if, if, we, uh, if we want to share God's word and follow the commands of Paul, it's not just an ordained pastor that can preach. Um, so, so this is... Um, and the difference between you know, preaching and teaching, so like we teach a Sunday school class, but there's something about the setting, and so there's something about uh, this art of homiletics, and so we're going to look at that, what this means uh, as, as we go along. And when we look at um, how to improve at something like preaching, we learn so much from somebody who is successful at it. In the, in the past, and if somebody stuck when we when we have a homiletics class, uh, we we read sermons by some of the most famous um, preachers of all time, and so um, many in the seminary uh, honor someone named Martin Lloyd Jones. I don't know if you've heard that name, but he was out of England, and he was known as one of the greatest preachers of all time. And so somebody wrote down this is before video, of course, wrote down his sermons. And so we can analyze the sermons and, and the, way that, the way that he did it. Um, and one of the, um, uh, when we look at, at what this means, uh, it says, uh, reprove, rebuke, exhort. And so the best sermons actually uh, are not necessarily the ones that make us feel good. They're the ones that challenge us. And that's, that's one of the distinctives of Preaching is when we teach God's word, we want to learn about it. But when someone is preaching, it's maybe we will we will be um, we will be rebuked, which means 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 convicted to change, or even told we're doing something wrong. And that's the challenge of that. And I've talked before about John Sung, who's known as the Billy Graham of Asia, and so he was uh, in the 1930s throughout the Chinese-speaking world. He would get up there on stage, he'd preach three times a day, and he would, um, he would have a coffin on stage with him. And he would say, unless you con confess your sins, and usually, and usually it was pastors, unless you confess your sins, you're going to be in that coffin and you're going to go to hell. And so that's, that's a rebuke. And they would, and they would, and, and he would say, you need to come up and you need to, you need to destroy your cigarettes and your, your alcohol. And, and, and they would come up on stage and put, put that in, in, the, um, in the coffin. And so that was, that, that was, that was John Sung. So he offended some, but many, many lives were changed because of that. And then, of course, I've, I've talked another, uh, I've talked before about Andrew, Andrew G., who went kind of behind John Sung and said, we're going to provide the training, including homiletics, for those that are convicted, because maybe they do need to improve. And so, um, uh, and so Andrew D. founded uh, uh, Sa'at, South A Southeast Asian Biblical Seminary, which is now in Malang. And so that was for the purpose of training pastors, basically. And homiletics was a big part of that. So I think it's still very good at homiletics, right? And a lot of Indonesian pastors I meet uh, they, uh, either their parent, their father went to Sa'at, and the most famous, probably the most famous Indonesian uh, pastor is named Stephen Tong. Have you heard of Stephen Tong, Austin? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, 
Yeah, so I, I did some research about him because, again, as, like, as I said, to learn from famous, gifted pastors and preachers. We have a big advantage now because we can watch them on YouTube. Although most of his preaching is in Indonesian, of course. But, um, but he, he um, as a 15-year-old, um, he, uh, he loved, uh, he hated Christians and Christianity. And he was, he was, uh, he believed in communism. And, um, but his mother had a devoted, was devoted to God, deep spiritual life. And she had, this, this is a common case. And so he, he his, his mother prayed for him every morning and had a big impact on him. Prayed that God would guide her children. And, um, and then his mother asked him in 1957 uh, to attend a conference uh, that, was, that was held by Sa'at and, um, in Balong. And the last day of the conference, Andrew G. gave a powerful revival sermon. So he was a gifted preacher because he had learned from John Sun. And, um, and at the end of that sermon, Stephen Tong gave his life to Christ. And so it was that amazing. So that's, this is, we're going to talk more about that in a few minutes, but this is evangelistic preaching. And so he became a Christian that day and began to preach and share the gospel. And then just three years later, in 1961, he enrolled at Sa'at to be trained as a pastor. Um, and then he joined the faculty of Sa'at, Sa um, but also as he was doing this, he's, he developed his preaching gift, and so he became of it. So we see this with, with many, they have a call in their life, and an, really it's a, an anointing to preach, and so he clearly had that, and um, he, he traveled all over it says Europe, America, Australia, Japan, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Thailand, Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, and wherever there were Chinese speakers, because he was, he was Chinese, Indonesian, or Indonesians, and then um, he attended seminars, and then he established Stephen Tong Evangelistic Ministries uh, to preach, and then he started a church, a denomination in Indonesia, uh, and became, became a pastor, and uh, guest lectured all over the world, and, um, and uh, but he, he has this gift. Have you heard him live? No, no live. Yeah, you too. Yeah. So, um, uh, and, and this is amazing. So, I, uh, this is this is according to Wikipedia. Um, his typical schedule, because I remember John Sun preached three times a day, six days a week, and so typically when someone is using their spiritual gift. They, it's like God multiplies the time, and it's, they, set, they have set this energy. So, uh, so his weekly preaching schedule, this says in 2009, uh, two Sunday services in Jakarta, and then he flies to Singapore and preaches two services at a church in Singapore. And then Monday he travels to Malaysia and preaches in Kuala Lumpur. Then uh, Tuesday he travels to Hong Kong, and preaches in Hong Kong, and then Wednesday night he goes to Taipei, Taiwan, and preaches. Isn't that amazing? And so, uh, so that, and, and since 2009, so that's, 50, so he's, he's 69 when he's doing this, you know. But that's, you know, that's, but he has that gift of preaching, and he's, he's clearly called by God, and lives are, are, are changed. Uh, and his, his, uh, his church is called Messiah Cathedral. Have you heard of that? In, in uh, Jakarta, uh, opened in 2008. Uh, the aud two auditoriums total 8,000 people. And so that's, you know, so he is a great example. And so uh, this morning I dialed him up on YouTube and, and uh, heard him preach in English seven years ago. You know, and so it's, it's so interesting uh, when, when you look at someone who has this uh, preaching gift. Um, it's clear that when they speak, they are speaking as a messenger of God. And, um, and, and so later, um, uh, Paul talks about, uh, about uh, basically false teaching, but uh, not sound teaching, not sound preaching. And so what we learn in 
homiletics classes, there are different kinds of preaching, and so it's important to know about that so we can recognize um, different types of preaching. And so the most, uh, most of, of these um, gifted preachers, and we see in our, in our day and age, it's named John Piper, Tim Keller in New York, who just passed away recently, uh, that it's usually uh, what's called expository preaching. You heard that word before, expository. So it comes from actually from expositing or exposing God's word. So that means going verse by verse through through a through a passage and systematically explaining and interpreting the passage of scripture to, to let the let the listeners know the meaning. Okay, so that is um, uh, it's popular in many many. Uh, Seminaries, and so I, would, I, I used to live in Dallas, and so Dallas Theological Seminary was very big on its most. So I could always tell someone who's trained at Dallas Seminary because they'd stand here like this. They'd always have the Bible in their hand, and they would go verse by verse. And some of the most famous preachers, as well as our preachers, they will say, "Okay, we're going to preach through Romans, and it will take you know how long it will take? Three years." And they'll sometimes spend one Sunday on one passage of Romans, but they're explaining it and interpreting it uh, and, and helping to apply it. So, um, uh, so that, that, that's what takes a lot of time. Um, and so uh, the most popular form, as I mentioned, is verse by verse. And so, so when, I, when I preach, uh, I, I tend to focus on a passage, and that's why I've been inspired to preach through with you in the last five or six years, uh, Acts and then the letters, uh, the, uh, and the last uh, three letters of, of Paul. Um, but another approach would be topical preaching, and that would be, okay, I'm going to preach about angels, and then finding text that talks about angels. So that's, called, uh, that's a topic. Um, and then another extreme is 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 kind of like a self-help. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna preach about happiness, and so that's where I think it goes off the rails a bit, because that, that a, a little bit more like psychology. Just and then we're I'm pulling verses from the Bible. It's called proof texting, to find verses from the Bible that will prove what I'm trying to teach. So it's very different. So so most um, gifted preachers. Um, uh, don't use topical approach. Don't use kind of the uh, uh, self-help approach, uh, but but do focus on a specific book. And uh, and you know the challenge for me is that I like to tell stories, of course. And so there's so that some of the pastors who are committed to the expository approach, there's almost no illustrations. And so like when you hear John MacArthur preach, he just explains what this means. But he doesn't apply it to, to our lives. And so that's hard for somebody who's exploring Christianity to say, how does this apply to my, you know, to think how does this apply to my lives? And so that's, that's a, there's no right or wrong answer because there's strong feelings about that. I tend to want to mix that. I want to look at God's word, look at what the Greek means, but then I also want to apply what does that mean for us today? And so I, so I think just like many things, the balance is, is um, the key because that it, the uh, if we're inviting someone who doesn't have a biblical a Bible background to church, uh, who doesn't even doesn't maybe believe that the Bible is is true, then that's harder to make a connection, and so um, so that's the challenge. And uh, and then the other other part of this passage, so I could I could uh, to illustrate this I could have said our passage is. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, because there's a lot there. Um, but the first part of that passage, preach the words, and we talked about that. And then what does it mean to be ready in season and out of season? And so that's, so that's where we, will, we can go deeper and, um, and look at uh, this idea in season and out of season. So typically when we look at a passage, uh, a phrase like that, 
what does it mean to be ready? So I tend to look up words. I want to look at what the Greek says. And so the, the word translated ready is, uh, comes from the Greek word that means stand. And so stand is different from sitting down. So standby, like when, we're, when I'm flying on a plane, means I'm ready to board the flight if there's room. But standby means you're ready. And so that's, <coughs> or on duty. And so <coughs> that word in the Greek has a sense of urgency. So when Paul says be ready, that means it's urgent. You, you, you've always got to be ready. To, and so for me, what that means is at Chick-fil-A, I'm always ready to preach, which means to tell God's word. And so that's uh, when I'm at the mosque, when I, when, when I was asked, do Christians believe in a day of judgment? Right? I need to be ready with a response. And it needs to be from God's word. And so that's, that's the key. So, um, and so Timothy, and then what does it mean uh, to be in season and out of season? Okay, so we have seasons of life, we have seasons of, of the year. Um, and so uh, when we look at, at the meaning of that, it means, it means when it's convenient or inconvenient. So that's the best translation when it says in season, out season. Really when you look at the, this is, this is what expository preaching is, to get behind the word and say, what does that really mean? And, and that comes from looking at the Greek, praying over it, asking God what it means. And so, convenient or inconvenient. So, uh, so a good time or a bad time. And so that's, so when I'm, <clears throat> when I'm a little bit grumpy or sick and I get asked a question, about the day of judgment, or when there's an opportunity uh, to share God's word with someone, if it's not convenient, but that's what Paul is saying. It doesn't matter if it's convenient or not. You, you need to be ready if you are truly going to be an evangelist, a pastor. And so that's a good message, I think, for us, right? It's not uh, sharing, loving people, being Jesus to people isn't only for when we feel good about it, when we're, when we're uh, when it's convenient. Um, and so, um, so Timothy is, uh, is preparing, is being prepared by Paul to do, and really not more than just preaching, pastoral things, um, whether it's convenient or not, in every situation. And so, again, that's a challenge for us. Uh, and then even as we look deeper into this, into verse 2, um, what does it mean to, and I mentioned this a little bit already, to reprove? So I, again, to prepare for the sermon, I look, I look that word up. What does that mean? To reprove. And that means to scold someone or to gently correct someone. And so that's what reproving, so that's what sermons do. Um, and, that's, um, and that sends us back to 2 Timothy uh, 3, 16, 17, which I shared about. All scripture is breathed out by God. Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training righteous. So this is the idea that it's God's word that, that convicts us, that um, that corrects us. And rebuke is is a, a little bit of a negative word. So expressing disapproval or criticizing someone. And that's what John Sung did so well. Um, so Stephen Tong in English, he was he was pretty direct. And, the, and some of the best preachers are 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 pretty direct because they feel called by God. And then exhort is there as well. Exhort is to encourage someone. So at the end of these more negative uh, reprove and rebuke is to exhort or correct. <coughs> and then the, uh, moving on this passage, I need to model doing this right. So we can't just spend the whole time on, on one verse. So the time is coming, and it says in verse 3, when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And that's exactly what's happening today. So there's certain pastors, and I, I, won't, I won't name any, but, they're usually, but there are some in Singapore, these huge churches, and it, basically the message is if you, if, you, um, if you come to church, if you give, if you, um, if you uh, become a Christian, then God will bless you. You will, you will have favor with God. So that's called the prosperity gospel. 
but it's not in Scripture. And so those, but, but often uh, preachers are, are charismatic. So they are, they, 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 when they speak, um, they speak with passion. There's, there's, there's something, something about them that, that others want to follow them. And those are false teachers. And then, in fact, many cults start, especially in the U.S., when there's a charismatic uh, person who is seems like they're preaching God's word, but they're not. And so that's why it's important for us to recognize what it means uh, to be a fully gifted and anointed preacher and to, and to check it with God's word. So if you don't believe, if you, if you have doubts about me, then you, you need to go to God's word and say, actually, God's word says something different. And that's a challenge uh, when I prepare for a sermon, is I better not be making it up on my own, right? I better, I better be looking at the scripture. The scripture, uh, God's word, is, is the teacher. And that's my job to interpret it and just to proclaim God's word. But also the challenge is when we apply it. Uh, and so, so that's, this, this is a strong warning uh, to Timothy. There, People will not endure sound teaching, so they don't want to. Uh, they don't want to be rebuked, right? They want to feel good after the preacher, and so that's and that's what uh, Paul's worrying about. Um, and he even uses this word, um, uh, itching ears. That's about about uh, listening. And then uh, and then as we look at uh, yeah, then we'll turn away from listening, and it says in verse four, the truth, and wander off into myths. The myths are false stories, but it's very, very tempting. And then, uh, this says in verse 4, driven by their own desires. And so you will always, you know, so that's selfishness. And then he says in verse 5, as for you, always be sober-minded. So sober-minded means, means, uh, means not uh, carried off by, by um, is the whims and, the, and your and passions, but be sober-minded, endure suffering. So he's telling you that will happen, and do the work of an evangelist. And so when I read that, I said, "What does that mean? What's the work of an evangelist?" And it's actually it's only used two other times in, in the New Testament about this idea of about being an evangelist. And so, um, but the, the the reality is that. Evangelism is uh, is the goal of expository preaching, and, and evangelism is the gospel. And so, um, to do the work of an evangelist means to proclaim the gospel message. So already in this sermon, I have told you the gospel in response to the day of judgment, the question from the lost. Right. So, you, so it's important for an expository preacher who is preaching God's word. Uh, to, to keep repeating the gospel message that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he rose on the third day and we can be forgiven for our sins and have our, our relationship with God restored uh, through the sacrifice of Jesus. And so that's the gospel message, the good news. And so you, we find that that's the work of an evangelist. It's very, very powerful. And when we, when we, when we hear someone who has that, uh, that gift, sometimes it's within their church, but the most famous uh, person doing the work of evangelists I mentioned already is Billy Graham, right? So Billy Graham uh, preached to 250 million, 250 million people live. And at one point, um, there was a survey in 2005 that one in six American adults had heard him preach live. And so in 2000. Four, he came to the Rose Bowl of Pasadena, one of his last, he called it crusades, which isn't the best word. Uh, and so he came to Pasadena in the Rose, to the Rose Bowl, and I think for three nights. And so, um, and it's, it's, it turns out that the, uh, his evangelistic preaching is so powerful that even Christians, this is the idea of, uh, about rebuke, even Christians can be can feel rebuke and can rededicate their lives to Christ, and so he would give a he would give a message, um, and, and, and with his southern accent, very very uh, powerful, 
And, uh, and then at the end, he would call for response. So this is, this is part of, of uh, preaching as well. So he'd call for it. And then uh, there were counselors on the, uh, on the, uh, from various churches on the, on the grass in the Rose Bowl. And, and he would say, come on down. And there'd be music playing. And people would come and, and, uh, and rededicate their lives to Christ or, or to follow Jesus. And many who were there were invited by friends. You feel okay, Rachel? Yeah, I feel kind of weak a little bit. Okay, let's, yeah, let's, let's get some fresh air.